How's the uh, how's the audio sound right now? That sounds good. Okay. Good morning. I know some of you are fighting the fight today. So uh, with that storm coming across the central, I don't know if any of those offices are on or not. But uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, take part in this in this webinar. Just going to get a couple things organized here. Okay, so um, this talk that I'm going to give uh, is from some research that a, a bunch of people did uh, that were on, in our working group and, and took quite some time to put together. Uh, the original work was started by Scott Watson, who's now the hydrologist in Pleasant Hill, and he had gone through some of our area and started documenting heavy snowstorms. and. Uh, and that was maybe about the late 1990s, I think, when he was doing that work. And so we had this composite, this work of all these storms that were in our area with the idea that we'd go back to St. Louis and use a package called Slew Brew to composite some of the, uh, not just the basic fields, but some of the more interesting forcing fields for these heavy snowfall events. And um, that was kind of the period then that, that uh, Jim Moore had uh, passed, and uh, we kind of that that whole study kind of took a back seat, and then um, was revitalized here in the last year. So uh, there's a number of players here. Uh, I worked on it, obviously, and Dan Jones, one of our interns here, Scott Watson, put the original uh, list of heavy snowstorms together, and then uh, three individuals from uh, St. Louis University, Dr. Uh, Chuck Graves. Chad Gravel and then Jason Goslin helped with uh, compositing the, the information using GEMPAC and uh, creating some of the graphics. So uh, I'm just going to be the presenter here and uh, show you some of the interesting findings we, we uh, came up with from this, from this study. Hopefully uh, we won't be too bandwidth challenged today. Um, I'll try to be patient with this. It, it is slide intensive. I don't have any loops, but uh, uh, looks like we're running pretty good. So our main objective here was was to try to get some good feeling for, or just to see if some of the composites would bear out any information on mesoscale forcing and the synoptics of uh, heavy snow events in our area. Uh, kind of look at the evolution of how these environments uh, evolve in time and uh, obviously use it for training in our office, especially for people that just come on station. Um, but even those that have been here for a while, maybe some of the interesting facets that we may be able to see uh, through some of this composite work with obviously the overall objective to improve our forecast. So our, our methodology to create the composite is obviously, as I talked about earlier, Scott Watson first did the work on, on finding heavy snow cases in our area where there were six inches or more of snow in a 12-hour period. Now, our, our study includes all the cases that were from six to, I don't know what our heaviest one was. Uh, I think we had one, one storm that was near 20 inches in a 24-hour period. And we use a cooperative data uh, database to, to look through the, for those cases. And we use the period from January 1979 through March 2009. And we mainly keyed in on 1979 because that's when the North American reanalysis data is uh, is available, and we wanted to use that um, <clears throat> gridded information to form the composites. So the next step was to uh, to look at the the NAR data, the North American reanalysis data, and try and figure out the uh, the 850 low track. And what we did was we we took that 850 low track, and when it crossed the 91st meridian, which is the uh, meridian that passes right through the center, nearly the center part of the lacrosse forecast area. And when the 850 low track passed across that meridian, we called that time equals zero. And then what we did was just composite um, using the 850 millibar low. 
And so everything is relative uh, to our, our forecast area for the heavy snow and uh, relative day 50 low. And I'll show you how that came out in a, in a second here. What we did was um, we, we originally had, had composited on the heavy snow where exactly the heavy snow fell. Uh, and, and St. Louis said that it actually comes out a little bit better if you use the 850 millibar low to, to composite on. And it, and it did, in fact, improve the, the information that we were able to come away with. So uh, and at the bottom of this slide, then we grouped the cases into northwest flow and southwest flow tracks. We had a bunch of different uh, categories that we took the heavy snowfall cases and put them into. Uh, but I'm only going to show you the, the more interesting cases here. And that was northwest and southwest flow regimes. And then we took the southwest flow regime and we split it into uh, uh, two categories, two groups. One was a deepening uh, cyclone, so the deepening cases from the southwest. And then the steady state or weakening cases were our second group from within that southwest flow domain. And then uh, once we came up with the, uh, the uh, composite parameters, uh, where the 850 low was, the times of heavy snowfall and those such, uh, or the eight, when the 850 low passed the 91st meridian, then we went back and, and uh, composited gem pack fields. So we could, any field we made in gem pack, we could use the NAR data uh, and create. So we were able to make different fields like frontogenesis and instability, uh, some of those different things, uh, triple pause pressure. Uh, so it was, it was kind of a unique way of doing this so that we could look at some of the forcing fields rather than just looking at heights and vorticity and 850 heights and some of those different things, which um, many people have done and looked at. And so we were interested in, in taking this a step for, further as far as compositing. So the bottom portion of this slide here now is what we, we came away with. We came away with six hourly time steps. We looked at the NAR precipitation data and also the observations from our cooperative network. Uh, and we could find out then when the heavy snow period was. And so I'm going to show you the 24-hour period that I've highlighted here uh, centered on the heavy snow period. Uh, and then what we've got is the, the first time stamp you'll see. I'm going to just show you a bunch of graphics, and we're going to just step through them through this 24-hour period. The first step will be uh, about six hours before the heavy snow period began. And we identified a 12-hour heavy snow period. So the next step on that would be the heavy snow begin time, which I put a 0, zero hour on, on the graphics. And then the actual heaviest snowfall time frame, which, was, which I'll say 0, 6 hours, meaning 6 hours into the heavy snow time. And then the heavy snow ending period basically 12 hours of the heavy snow period. So this will be the heavy snow ending uh, definition period. And then the last time step in the 24-hour period will be six hours after the heavy snow ended. So those are, we'll look, for, look at those different time steps for each of the three cases, the northwest flow, the southwest deepening cases, and the southwest steady state or weakening cases. I uh, just wanted to show this graphic, just kind of how the cases break down. Just draw your attention to the right side there. And uh, let me see if I can put a spotlight on it here. OK, so um, on the right-hand side of this graphic, then, you'll see the number of cases. And we've got quite a few cases here. The Northwest Flow was probably the, the lowest amount of cases that I was comfortable with, but we only had 16 there, showing that we don't see a lot of winter uh, heavy snowfall events from the Northwest in our, in our portion of the US. Uh, but there were 16 cases in there. And then the Southwest deepening cases, we had 76 going into that composite, which was a pretty high number. And then about half of those, um, that number was in the Southwest steady state or weakening, somewhere around 38. Uh, for that case data set. So just to kind of give you some idea on the numbers there. And then just the cases by month for our area, at least 50% of the population of these composites came from January and March. Uh, and the other ones were kind of spread out through the winter. We had a one October case and seven cases in April. OK, so just to give you a little bit on the uh, what the composites look like, uh, kind of get you oriented a little bit. 
we're going to be looking at this same kind of layout throughout the talk. Um, I'm, I'm showing here in the upper left is the uh, northwest flow cases. And those, again, are there's 16 of those. Uh, in the center part of the graphic, I'll tell you what the time is here. We're, it's our first time step in that 24-hour period that I was going to show you in the study. This is the T minus six hours prior to the heavy snow, the 12-hour heavy snow period. So we're six hours before the heavy snow is beginning now. In the center part of my graphics, I've got the, uh, the fields that you're going to be looking at, 850 heights in this case. The snow region uh, is bolded. You see that that's the image uh, that's underlaying the contours. And in the lower left is the southwest deepening cases, highlighted by the SWD. And then in the lower right, I've got the southwest steady state or weakening cases. And again, just the case numbers that are in each of those uh, data sets. And so I'm going to just run through the, the graphics in this kind of a, a setup for you as we walk through this study. The 850 low track, or the 850 low is denoted by a star on these graphics. Now, it might be kind of tiny for you to see, uh, but uh, in each of these panes, you'll see the 850 millibar low center is a star. So as we step through this, you can, you can visualize where that 850 or lower level uh, low is. Okay, so I'm just going to step through this first set, and this is 850 millibar heights. I've taken one more time step. You see the time in the middle here now is the heavy snow begin period. Again, that's a 12-hour period we're looking at. So this is when the heavy snow began. Uh, you can see here the some of the accumulated precipitation uh, is the image here uh, and snowfall. And this is just the 850 millibar heights. And so you see the northwest track in the upper left is obviously comes from the northwest. And uh, two lower panes, you'll see the low come out of the, the southwest. And this is just kind of just to kind of give you an idea of when the snow was falling. This is our heavy snow period, and you can see the NAR data has most of its precipitation right over our forecast area. So when we're looking at these, you know, uh, we basically look at our forecast area as kind of where the snow fell. And so everything is kind of relative to that forecast area that you see uh, on the underlying map. So that's where you have to kind of look at it. That's where the heavy snow fell for every panel that you see in the study. And so this is the heavy snow ending period. And you can see in the lower left, it's most lit up with that southwest deepening case. And I'm not too interested in what the um, water equivalent numbers are here. I'm just basically showing you um, uh, kind of an orientation set right here. So this is heavy snow ending you see in the upper center and then six hours after the heavy snow ends. And you can see over the forecast area, uh, my forecast area, the little cross forecast area, you can see the precipitation is now moving off to the northeast. OK, so just kind of a couple basic fields. I wanted to focus mainly on the forcing and instability fields. So I'm not going to go through a lot of um, composite fields of very basic uh, uh, meteorology fields here. I'm going to show you a couple here, and then we're going to move into more uh, or what I would call interesting fields. So here's just the mean sea level pressure six hours before this heavy snow period begins. Uh, you can see the track, obviously, um, coming from the southwest on the lower part of the screen and then the northwest in the upper upper left. Um, and then the 850 low is, is denoted by the star. This is heavy snow begin time. This is the center of the heavy snow period. Uh, you can see the... Uh, deepening low by definition of the data set in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, by far the most vigorous uh, low pressure system uh, at the surface. And now we're at the heavy snow ending period here, 12 hours in. Low is pretty much in the same place for all these cases, just to our south. A little bit of a difference in the three cases, but just to the south of the heavy snow area. Again, the heavy snow area is my forecast area. Um, and uh, the most vigorous low in the southwest deepening case, as you would expect. And then this is just six hours after the heavy snow period. I'll just wait until everybody gets that. So everybody kind of gets a feel for how these composites look um, and how we're going to step through time here. And 
from what I can tell, everybody's getting these graphics uh, in a pretty reasonable amount of time. Uh, is that true? Is anybody having a problem? Am I talking too fast compared to the graphics showing up? Uh, John, uh, did you, uh, John Fry, did you have your hand up? I noticed you had. Did you have a question? No, I must accidentally hit that button. Oh, okay. I got it. No problem. Okay, so an another basic field here. We'll just look at precipitable water here now uh, for the northwest case in the upper left again, southwest deepening in the lower left. And you'd expect the southwest cases to have uh, higher precipitable water uh, coming into the storm. And the northwest cases actually had about 133% normal uh, and not too much less than the southwesterly flow case, although the source region where that air was coming from in the southwest flow cases was much higher precipitable water air. Um, and, and over the forecast area, uh, about 200% of normal uh, for those cases. So I'm just going to step through here now to the heavy snow begin time. And it's not very surprising here uh, that you see the surge northward and into the storm. And again, the 850 low is, is the star in this one. So here's the heavy snow <clears throat> period. And the heavy snow ending period uh, as the moisture axis moves off to the east. Uh, so pretty good surge, just a little bit less uh, moisture in the southwest steady state weakening case versus the southwest deepening case. Uh, Really, it's a dynamical difference in these two systems that we'll see next uh, as we step into those. So here's the, the temperature advection, 850 millibar of temperature advection. <clears throat> and again, this is six hours prior to the heavy snow begin time. Uh, you'll notice one thing here in the northwest flow cases in the upper left, you'll see the intense uh, temperature advection out far in front of the of the uh, system, stronger than the southwest deepening case in the lower left as we step through here. Uh, pretty intense 850 temperature advection. And you'll notice most of these cases, too, that the temperature advection stays to the south of the heavy snow area or just on to the southern part of my forecast area. One other thing of note as we step through these cases here, uh, for the 850 millibar temperature field at least, the temperature didn't change at all. Uh, so we're under really strong warm advection, but the temperature, if you look at a point in my forecast area, the temperature wasn't changing, so it was pretty static, uh, which is just an implication that you might have a great deal of vertical motion from this warm advection rather than uh, actual warming going on. So here's heavy snow time for 850 millibar temperature advection. You see a really nice S-shaped baroclinic zone in the southwest deepening case in the lower left. Uh, and then kind of a muted uh, S-shaped baroclinic zone to the right of that in the southwest steady state or weakening cases. And that's really what you see throughout this whole talk is that that steady state or weakening low case uh, versus the deepening case just gives you the, the same general uh, feel as the deepening case, but obviously weaker because it's the central low pressure is not, not deepening in that case. And in the upper, upper left here, you can see a pretty strong signal of cold air advection behind the northwest flow case. Uh, we also don't see that in the southwest flow cases. So we're not only in this situation maybe putting down some pretty decent snowfall, but we also have a chance at uh, blowing it around with some pretty good cold advection behind it and, and possibly enhanced lapse rates. So here's the heavy snow ending time. And I'm waiting for you all to update. I don't know if you're seeing that slide.
you see a heavy snow ending in the central, in the top portion center of this slide at all? Anybody see that one? Yeah, we see in Des Moines. Okay, everybody else doesn't see it. I have a low audience view. My audience view has not changed, which makes me think we maybe had a a small downtime there with our band, with our uh, internet connection. Okay, you just it just changed right there. Right now, I've got 850 millibar high temperature advection isotherms, and it says similar patterns northwest focus warm air advection. Yeah, let's let's move to 700 millibars. Still not getting an audience view updating here. Oh, we got the 700 millibar slide here in Chenasson. This is Pleasant Hill. It looks like we've been uh, keeping up with what you've uh, been saying. So we have a current slide. Okay. Okay, so we're on 700 millibar heights, temperature advection and isotherms now. I just lost my audience view, so I can't really tell where you guys, how fast it is loading. Oh, there, it just updated. Okay, so let's talk about 700 millibars here. We're just going upstairs a little bit now, um, and what you'll notice here is <clears throat> in the northwest flow cases, very strong signal in the temperature advection. You'll see in the next uh, couple slides here compared to the southwest flow. There's very strong uh, and very, um, for a composite, if I just take a step ahead and send you that image, you'll see a very strong narrow signal of 700 millibar temperature advection. And uh, it's a, a really nice signal that we got out of this, the composites here. And not so much uh, in the southwest flow case. In fact, the steady state weakening has uh, no warm advective signal of, of note in the lower right. And so I'm going to step forward again to the heavy snow time. And I also highlighted on, on this slide the uh, minus 12 then the minus 12 isotherm just to kind of give you an idea where the southern edge of the dendrite region is for this same time period. And so you're looking at 700 millibar temperature advection. You can see down in the southwest flow case, southwest deepening cases, uh, the temperature advection is not real strong, uh, but it is maximized at this time of heavy snow. And uh, again, in the northwest flow cases, it's right over the forecast area. And the dendrite region is somewhat close to the forecast area in the northwest flow case, but in the southwest cases, it's really far up to the northwest. So at, the, at least at this level, it doesn't look like the, the dendrite region has a large impact uh, in, the, in the snow ratio and therefore snow, uh, snow total. Uh, at least a, a significant contribution from dendrites. And I'll show you a li uh, another field on that uh, later in the talk to kind of confirm that, that idea. So just take another step. Heavy snow is ending now, a heavy snow ending period here. And again, the signal, no real signal in the southwest flow, weakening in steady state cases. And finally here now in, in the northwest case in that heavy snow ending, you start to see a... Uh, you start to see the dendrite area kind of coming into the forecast area more than uh, you did before. Okay, so let's just look at the 300 millibar heights and isotax, and then I've also got divergence on here. <clears throat> just to kind of give you an idea what the, the jet forcing looked like uh, for these composites. And I was pretty happy with the signals we saw. Again, remember in the lower left, we had 76 cases uh, in this lower left composite, uh, by far the, the most prolific of, of the heavy, heavy snow events. Uh, and we got a pretty good signal there, too. Uh, so let's just go through the 300 millibar heights now. Uh, here's uh, six hours before the heavy snow ends. And you already start to see, I want you to kind of draw your attention to the southwest deepening case in this one. Uh, and watch how this, uh, this jet uh, more downstream of the ridge position here starts to develop over southern Canada uh, as we head into heavy snow time. And we really start to get a, a nice coupled jet signature. So this is at heavy snow begin time. 
You also notice that there's uh, two units here of, of divergence uh, on, the, on the cyclonic side of this uh, upper level jet here in a really nice place between the, uh, the ridge axis and the trough axis. We have a, a good curvature, a broad curvature um, contribution here to the atheostrophic wind, but also it's on the, a nice uh, exit region here where the parcels are decelerating, and so you have good divergence uh, on the left front of that jet streak as well. You certainly don't get that from the northwest and uh, southwest steady state or weakening cases like you do in the southwest deepening. <clears throat> this is heavy snow time, and now you see that we've uh, we've really ridge built in the eastern part of the United States. Uh, now we've increased the uh, gradient here in the height field, and so the jet, uh, you see a really nice uh, jet strengthening here. So you've got now the, a couple jet here where your parcels are, are accelerating into this northern uh, position jet. So you have divergence kind of south of the, the max in here, and so everything is kind of working together for the southwest deepening case. Up in the northwest flow, you don't see any type of a mesoscale type of signal in the uh, in the jet structure here. You just see a broad divergence over the whole area, in fact, the whole region uh, as a whole. So this southwesterly deepening case has a, a nice curvature, uh, really prime location here uh, for upper level divergence. Just kind of a reminder here on uh, the two terms of significance when we're talking about uh, that ageostrophic wind here, the, the curvature changes. Uh, typically, you see the best divergence uh, right in the inflection point between the trough and the ridge position uh, due to the curvature and sub, subgeostrophic flow in the, the trough axis and supergeostrophic flow over in the um, over on the ridge axis. And so you have a, a broader divergence signal uh, right at that inflection point kind of what we were seeing in the northwest flow case. Uh, just. And then the, uh, the speed term here, when you look at um, what most people remember, that four panel, that four quadrant jet streak, uh, really, if you key on what you really have to key in on there is the the speed change that the wind that the the air parcels are are going through. So it's that deceleration on the uh, the exit region uh, to get that cross stream adiastrophic wind. So the adiastrophic wind uh, pointed south uh, here in the exit region uh, of the jet stream. So those two um, work together, uh, and what's significant is that it's that change in uh, parcel airspeed uh, that that corresponds with that four panel look, uh, that four panel uh, uh, conceptual model that we had there, and that exit region of the jet stream. The big one on the left here is, is that it that that's the term that really constricts uh, the upper level, uh, the divergence and the signal for vertical motion, more so than the broad curvature term. And on the right hand side here, just a picture from a paper from the uh, Queen Elizabeth II storm back in 1978. On the right-hand side, is, it's just a curvature term, and you see the, the vertical motion, and I've highlighted it with the arrows here, on what the, uh, the vertical motion, how broad it is. But when you look at just the exit region of the jet on the left-hand side and, and how constricted that vertical motion signal is, so you, that's what you're seeing in that southwest flow deepening cases is really how that how that uh, those both are working together, but you're also on the, a real nice exit region there to uh, to shrink the vertical motion and the forcing for the vertical motion onto the mesoscale more. So here's just the snow ending period, uh, and you see that in the southwest flow deepening case, the jets increased during this period. Uh, the the southwest uh, jet has gone over 100 knots now, and you can see that really nice mesoscale signature to the divergence law and just contrast it with the northwest flow case where you don't really have a couple jet. You have broad, uh, you just have kind of a curvature term working there for you and no real good exit region or entrance region of, uh, of the jet stream or a jet street.
Okay, so let's move on to the next field here. And we'll just look at the triple pause pressure here. The, uh, what we've done is just map the 1.5 PVU surface. So what you're looking at is contours of pressure. And so we start here at six hours before the heavy snow time. And I just kind of draw your eyes again to the southwest deepening case. We've got uh, a deeper uh, tropopause pause down over the desert southwest, kind of into Colorado. And again, the 850 low is indicated by the star. So it's in an area of implied upper level potential vorticity advection. Uh, and I also want you to look at the uh, northwest flow case here. You can see that uh, we do have a little circle here of deepening uh, over Montana, a little bit of a fold in the trope. And let's just kind of take this through time. In the lower left panel here, you'll, you'll note how the low in the southwest is ejecting towards the forecast area but also how the reservoir to the north here, the 350 millibar dip and that red arrow indicating that we're kind of going to merge these or phase these uh, potential vorticity areas. And the trope, trope becomes one with time. Here's heavy snow period. You can see a, a fairly nice signal in the northwest flow case as well. Uh, lower than 350 millibars there with the tropal pause. Uh, and we're deepening with time now in the southwest case. We start to see the 400 contour come up uh, right over northern Missouri for the southwest flow deepening case by the time this heavy snow is ending here. Uh, and you can see the 850 low position, again, still, still on that potential uh, vorticity advective area. But you also notice it's starting to come back a little bit more underneath the fold a little bit more as the occlusion process takes place. And I also put in, uh, if you've watched Phil's talk on the trowel and occlusion process, he did a nice review of frontogenesis and trowels and this treble cleft signature that Martin talked about in, in 1998. And so here's a picture in the center uh, uh, of this diagram. And you can see how we're starting to replicate that on the left-hand side there with that south, lower left southwest deepening case, uh, indicative of a... Uh, a trowel or a precipitation shield being present uh, in that that minimum, if you will, over Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, and then you look at the uh, the Northwest Flow case, and you don't see really any deepening with that case, but uh, you you it's more of a steady state trope fold that's moving through uh, with the 850 low on the eastern flank of that storm. And then just looking briefly at the Southwest steady state weakening system. Uh, there's really no, there's no uh, integ integration or matching or uh, deepening of that northern reservoir of, of uh, potential vorticity coming into that, that system to the south. It's kind of on its own, and you notice it hasn't deepened now at all compared to the, the left-hand case. And by definition, we sp split those two data sets out, uh, but it's just kind of an interesting contrast. Okay, so just kind of moving one step forward, you see a, even more of that uh, that treble cleft signature in the lower left. This is the six hours after heavy snow period, so that system's wrapping up in the lower left. There, you see a, a more of an occluded type of look to the tropal pause pressure, uh, and really the same kind of look to the northwest flow case. It's kind of a steady state uh, tropal pause behavior there. Up, up up to the northwest in the northwest case. OK, so front of Genesis now. I'm showing the 700 millibar heights here. And front of Genesis is shaded in the red. So that's the image that you'll see there. And I also threw in the dendrite. Uh, isotherms minus 12 and minus 18. So you kind of got a bounded uh, isotherm region there showing the dendrite area just to see if it's playing games in the area of your frontogenesis. The one thing of note here is look at how far out ahead of the main system that the frontogenesis is giving signal, um, really in, in all the cases. But if I just draw your attention to the left-hand side, on the left-hand side, um, 
you see the northwest flow case. You have frontogenesis signal showing up almost a thousand miles downstream. Same with the southwest deepening case. Uh, our system's still back in Colorado and Kansas, uh, but we've got the frontogenesis, weak frontogenesis in place well downstream. And I don't know if you've seen these, but in some of these in, in these cases of the bigger storms, sometimes you'll see this very narrow band of precipitation echo. It might not be hitting the ground. Uh, but you'll see a very thin band kind of showing its hand well out adva in advance of, of major system. Um, and it, it's just kind of showing that frontogenesis is in place there. It may not be strong at the time, but just kind of showing its hand. And I've seen that uh, happen in quite a few cases. Anyway, you see the, the dendrite area is not really a factor here. It's the closest to the northwest flow case, uh, but really pretty far north for the southwesterly flow cases. Let's just step forward here. Oops, sorry about that. Went the wrong direction. So here's the heavy snow begin period of real str uh, stronger and very narrow signal from the composites uh, for the uh, northwest flow case. And you start to see the southwest flow uh, deepening case starting to intensify, get organized a little bit more. But again, a very long frontogenetic uh, axis there that the storm is traveling along. So that's one of the big things that I stress to my forecasters is, is that storm track along the axis of frontogenesis really increases the duration of snowfall. And so something you have to be aware of. And that signal comes out really well in these composites. Take a step forward to the heavy snow time. Not real impressive in the northwest flow case. Uh, not much signal there, uh, but a really good signal here in the southwest deepening cases. Again, 70-some cases are in there, and we have a really nice, tight um, frontogenetic signal at 700 millibars. You can see the where you'd expect the response on the warm side of the frontogenesis is right over where the heavy snow would be falling over my forecast area. The signal in the lower right is not nearly as strong uh, as one would expect. Dendrite isotherms, not really a factor, at least in the southwest flow case. Uh, you can see the minus 12 is, is well up to the northwest here. Uh, so this vertical motion that's occurring, if it's on the south side of this frontogenesis over my forecast area, is really not um, playing games in that dendrite region. And then here's the heavy snow ending time, so the end of the 12-hour period of heavy snow. You can see it's just basically translating northeast. Uh, all the cases have weakened now uh, as we're tapering off our snowfall. And, and then for the uh, six hours after the heavy snow, uh, same thing, just kind of translating everything off to the northeast as you'd expect. So again, the, the big takeaway for me there was that we actually had some frontogenetic signal well downstream of the low, uh, even though it was weak. It was in place already. Uh, and then the storm track was along that axis of frontogenesis. So let's now take the frontogenesis and just add on the instability and just kind of evaluate what the uh, equivalent potential vorticity looks like above that frontogenetic layer. So we looked at the 500 to 700 millibar equivalent potential vorticity above the 700 millibar frontogenesis. So the contours are now frontogenesis. The image is the uh, stability, basically. And so if you look on the left-hand side, I've, I've highlighted with a circle the uh, stability here. The darker blue, if you will, is the uh, negative EPV. And then I've also highlighted the weak stability, weak statically stable. Um, stability area from 0 to about 0.25 EPV. So that's in that, that bluish greenish color, more of an aqua. Um, so that's the stability, um, weak statically stable air. And so this is a composite. So this is kind of a, kind of a little bit of a trickier composite field to do and, and, um, and try to get some results out of it. And so you, have to have a, you would have to have a pretty strong signal uh, in the cases for upright instability if you're going to get it. Uh, if you're if it's if it's really widespread in these cases, 
uh, you would expect that signal to be there for upright instability. And as I'll show you as we step through, that it's mostly weakly, statically stable. Um, it doesn't mean, of course, with these composites, one of the things you have to remember is that it doesn't mean that you can't have a storm that produces heavy snow uh, and, and um, you have a, a case where you see upright instability, even though we're showing static stability uh, in the composites. So remember that these are composites. It doesn't mean that one snowstorm can't have upright instability if the composites show just static stability. So keep that in mind. So let's take a step forward here. And so here's the heavy snow begin time. You see, again, our really, really nice and narrow frontogenetic signal for the northwest flow case up in the upper left-hand corner. And you see most of the environment there above the frontal zone uh, is, has weak static stability. And the upright instability is well to the south, at least for this layer of 500 to 700 millibars. And you basically see that same signal here for the uh, southwest flow case as well. But the stat, the, the um, weak static stability is in place well out ahead uh, of the storm, uh, much like the front of Genesis is. You've got weak static stability through Michigan and Wisconsin all the way downstream of the low. 850 low is, is still in Kansas for the southwest flow deepening case. But I've got my static stability and my front of Genesis in place already well downstream. So let's take one step forward in time and go to the uh, center of the, oh, I'm sorry, I was going to show a cross-section first. Um, we'll take a cross-section through the frontal zone here in the northwest flow case. And in the lower right, in the lower, I'm sorry, the lower left, you will see the cross-section that we created through the frontal genetic zone. And then in the, and in the upper right here now, I've got the cross-section and I've highlighted the heavy snow area. Uh, and you can see that weak static stability, and it's fairly high up. That was one of the surprising results that I think I saw in these composites was how actually how how vertically the static stability was, the weak static stability was, how high up in the vertical. Uh, I expected it to come in a little bit lower uh, into the frontal zone, but really it's really above 500 to 300. It's somewhere in that 500 millibar and up range, which was somewhat surprising to me. Um, and then in the lower right, I just have the vertical motion and uh, relative humidity greater than 85%. So the big takeaway from this pane is you see the frontal, frontal zone in here shaded in red in the upper right. Uh, but the instability, the upright instability is well off to the south, like you see in the plan view. Uh, and the static, weekly static stability uh, is pretty high, 500 millibars and above. Okay, so back to the plan view now. We take one step forward and go to the heavy snow time. This is when, again, remember the southwest flow case is getting itself organized. Uh, you see that unit, six units of uh, frontogenesis, that's six degrees K uh, per kilometer every three hours. And so that's six units there on the northwest part of my forecast area. And then the weekly static, uh, static instability coming right up, weekly statically stable air coming right up to that frontal zone. Uh, uh, above the frontal zone so that it can release that instability. So the frontogenesis here is your forcing mechanism for vertical motion, starts to move the parcels, and with the weekly static conditions above the frontal zone, uh, the idea in theory is that the frontal zone would uh, release that instability and you get uh, heavy snow uh, forcing. And so all these cases are heavy snow composites, obviously, so that's what indeed occurs in these, these cases. On the southwest steady state or weakening in the lower right-hand corner, uh, you see uh, weaker frontogenesis and then kind of a uh, more disorganized static stability in place. But you still have some static stability in place there. OK, so let's move ahead another six-hour time step. Or oh, I'm sorry, I did that again. I put another cross-section in. Uh, here's a cross-section for the southwest flow case at this time during the heavy snow time. So in the lower left was our our plan view image. And so in the lower left is our plan view image of frontogenesis and instability. And then uh, our cross sections taken from north central Minnesota into central Illinois. And the results are in the upper right hand corner here. Again, instability 
EPV is shown in the uh, aqua color. And here it's a little bit lower than we saw in the northwest flow cases. But again, you see uh, a pretty good depth to it. Um, you know, over 100 millibars, definitely uh, into the 200 millibar range, uh, sometimes deeper. Uh, negative uh, EPV is held off to the south, as we saw in the plan view, um, and a pretty pretty nice shading of red here, uh, ind indicative of the frontogenesis. So we've got frontogenesis in place, uh, the frontal circulation uh, able to tap into that uh, weak static stability above the frontal zone. And as you guess from the southwest deepening cases uh, are most dynamic as we've seen so far. Um, the vertical motion in the lower right is strongest in the NAR data uh, and the relative humidity the deepest. So by far the strongest signal as, as we would expect. Just taking a couple other composites at the same time for the southwest flow deepening case. I just kind of wanted to show these all in, in unison here. In the upper left-hand corner, I didn't show moisture convergence and moisture transport, uh, but at this heavy snow period time, uh, you see the moisture convergence is the strongest in the upper left for the southwest flow case uh, at heavy snow time. You see good convergence in the low levels and moisture transport uh, from the south, from that rich PW uh, air mass to the south. On the upper right, you see the PV that we looked at already, but we're starting to see that um, consolidation of the trope coming in and a higher reservoir of PV being injected into the system uh, and and then the frontogenesis and the instability and in the lower right the uh, upper level signal with the upper level jet and divergence aloft. So a really nice time frame in the composites at least for these uh, cases something that I would going in expect to see um, and I was kind of happy to see that with 70 some cases. So now we'll move back on to plan view and just look at continue to look at the 700 millibar frontogenesis and the instability aloft. You start to see now by the time the snow is ending uh, in the northwest flow case, you start to see that the instability is fairly far south or being used up. So we don't see that instability um, as prolific now. Same with the southwest flow deepening case, it's either being shunted off to the east or being used up, so we start to see a diminishing instability. Uh, and even in the lower right there, kind of a chaotic, disorganized look to that, that system in the lower right with the steady state weakening systems. Just go downstairs a little bit to 850 millibars and just do that same analysis. We'll look at frontogenesis. And then we will look at the uh, frontogenesis with the instability above it. Uh, you can already probably guess with the instability. We saw the instability up pretty high for these last cases in the cross section. So it would be interesting to look at what the instability looks like in plan view. Here's the frontogenesis at 850 millibars. And let's go to the heavy snow begin time. And you can see the heavy snow axis again with the frontogenesis. Um, pretty far downstream uh, in the southwest cases. We go to the heavy snow time, and you notice here at 850 millibars a really strong frontalytic signal. Uh, that was somewhat surprising to me to see that strong of a frontalytic signal at 850 millibars uh, with the frontogenesis. Remember the front, frontalytic signal, the response to that forcing comes on the cold side. Uh, the lift comes on the cold side of that frontalytic signal, so it works uh, in tandem here, um, and that in that frontal zone, uh, so you got some pretty strong concentrated lift going on there in the northwest flow case in the upper left. Uh, and then again, you see the frontogenesis uh, kind of right through the forecast area in the southwest deepening case in the lower left. So that case has frontogenesis axis right through the forecast area, and the strongest signal that we saw of the three cases was in that southwest deepening. Uh, case. We go to the heavy snow ending time frame. Southwest deepening case draws your eyes to it in the lower left. Uh, really no signal in the northwest flow case. Uh, but again, the southwest deepening case is really getting going at this time. Um, 
and that response would probably be a little bit south of the heavy snow area. So it looks like the 700 millibar frontogenesis was a little bit better tied to the heavy snow area being in my forecast area. Here you'd expect the response for the southwest deepening case to be a little bit further south, uh, more towards like Dubuque and northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin. So at least for the heavy snow, it looks like it correlated a little bit better with the 700 millibar frontogenesis that we looked at earlier. And that's not anything different from what Novak and some different people have shown with snow bands and, and heavy snow bands in particular. So here's the 850 millibar frontogenesis, and then again the layer, 200 millibar layer above it uh, with equivalent potential vorticity. And I've done the same with the shading, the bluish teal aqua, whatever color that is, uh, is the static, weak static stability. And then the uh, upright instability or negative EPV is in the darker blue. So let's just step through this time frame here. Here's the heavy snow time. You can see how the instability is further south here. Um, at least what we're slicing through in this 650 to 850 period uh, layer, uh, we're not we're not seeing a lot of the instability into the front of the zone. Uh, that remember in the cross sections we saw the instability coming out high coming into these frontal zones higher up. So you you see that in plan view on these graphics as a separation between the front of genetic area and the instability, the instability being much further south. So I'll just take another step forward to the heavy snow ending time. And again the stability is uh, well south of the frontal zone there. So you definitely have a better matching of the frontogenesis and the instability in the 700 millibar and 7 to 500 millibar EPV. Those kind of patterned up and, and contributed uh, in, a, in a more favorable signal than what we're seeing here at 850 millibars. Just a few slides left now. I've got a um, dendrite growth depth. What, I, what we did was just measured the depth in millibars of the minus 12 to minus 18 C uh, isotherms uh, and how deep that layer was. Um, to, going into this study, it was my feeling that uh, most of these southwest flow cases for sure, uh, and if you saw some of the work I did earlier with the dendrite um, and extreme snow ratio work, that, that we were probably overplaying in our AFDs and our forecast process this layer from minus 12 to minus 18 for these major storms that, that yeah, you know, in the atmosphere, somewhere we have to cross minus 12 to minus 18 typically in the winter time, uh, but there's a climatology to it, and my idea was that the climatology was probably, um, we were right at the climatological levels for our southwest flow cases. Possibly the northwest flow cases could have gotten above the climatological depth, but to me, the climatological depth is somewhere around 75 millibars um, to, a, to 100 millibars, maybe, uh, in the winter time. But for most cases, it seemed to me that we were just we were we would mention these in our AFDs or think about it in our forecast process when really the contribution of dendrite crystals to the overall snow ratio was probably not that high and wasn't going to bump you, uh, bump you into a significant uh, number. But let's go through these, and I'll just show you what happened here. The uh, Hold on, I just changed, hit the wrong button there. Let me go forward here. The heavy snow uh, begin time, uh, if you look over the southwest, we have 75 to 100 millibars over the forecast area, so nothing outstanding, definitely nothing that would, if you saw my extreme ratio talk, would suggest somewhere, we, we don't see anything over 150 millibars at 200, 250 millibars, uh, anywhere near the forecast area. So it's 75 to 100 millibars down the in the lower left for the southwest deepening. Um, and even for the northwest flow cases, you're a little deeper, uh, maybe in that 100 to 125 regime, but nothing outstanding. But this probably would give you some small contribution uh, of dendrites and, and higher snow ratios versus the southwest cases. Let's take that one more step forward in time. Just watch how it evolves. You start to see the cold air being brought southward in a lot of these uh, graphics. The southwest flow case, again, most of your deeper dendrit, 
extender to growth area as well, northwest of the heavy snow area, the heavy snow area being in my forecast area. But you see most of the Dakotas is 125, still not even that deep. Uh, but that's where your contribution would be for uh, higher snow ratios. Up to the northwest flow case, you start to see some 125s to 150s making into the northern part of the forecast area. So possibly some contribution there uh, versus the southwest cases. And then just watching it evolve in time, here's the heavy snow ending. You start to see the dendrite region grow a little bit by the time the snow is ending, heavy snow is ending. And then with the cold air advection behind the wave, you start to see a little bit deeper dendrite growth region moving into uh, the area. So the northwest flow cases uh, would be the most prone to seeing a little bit of enhanced ratio from dendrite growth. But I would probably say that the, that the southwest cases weren't uh, really significant. So just in summary here, it kind of provides a nice PowerPoint show, and I didn't show you all the different graphics, but for people arriving on station and just kind of organizing our thoughts as meteorologists and, and looking at training, it, it provides a nice background on some of the different forcing. I saw some really nice signals, some really tight signals for composites that I didn't think I'd see in some of the temperature advection fields and the front of Genesis. Uh, they really composited well. Uh, for the southwest deepening cases, uh, obviously we have our strongest forcing there. Really nice coupled jet, um, especially with the curvature and the speed term kind of uh, working together there to downscale the lift over the heavy snow area to work in cooperation with the front of Genesis and the, the weak static stability that was in place over the, the heavy snow area. Uh, we also saw a really nice signature in the uh, tropopause uh, mapping uh, and the 1.5 PVU surface. We watched the, how that evolved with time and saw that treble clef signature. And as far as the front of Genesis, again, in place well downstream of the low center, and the storm track was right along the major axis of the front of Genesis, if you will, uh, increasing the duration of the snowfall. And for stability, we saw it come in pretty high. Uh, most of it was above 600 millibars, and we saw weak static stability in place for those, uh, for most of the cases here. And then for the dendrite growth uh, contribution, how much of the total uh, ice crystals will be of the dendritic type? It looks like it may have a little bit of impact uh, impact on those northwest flow warning cases and snow ratios, uh, but not really for the southwest cases, I would say. And there's a similar paper to this work um, that was just published in the NWA Digest by uh, Springfield and St. Louis. They looked at some of the, the snow events down in that area, and that's in the NWA Digest if you're interested in that. Similar process, um, and they showed some different fields than what I showed you. So that's all I have, and um, be open to questions if you have any. Questions for Dan? You can get these PowerPoint. It's on the, I can, John, you can send out the link to it. I think I uploaded it some time back, but I, I, this is the PDF I showed you, but I've got a PDF and a PowerPoint. The PowerPoint's pretty, pretty large. It's like 150 to 200 meg. I think it's like 180 megabytes, the biggest PowerPoint I've ever made because um, it's just got all those different graphics in it. But there's a PDF that's smaller. That's what I showed you today, and you don't lose much uh, by downloading that one. But that's what, I think that show has got a little bit, uh, uh, it's got more graphics in it uh, than what I showed you. Okay, and we'll have the recording and the, uh, I'll get, make sure I have the, the correct files. I believe I do, and we'll have those all available for everybody, and we'll send an email out when when they're ready. Great. Thanks for your attention today, and thanks for coming on the call. If you uh, have feedback, I'd love to hear from you, email or you know, whatever you want to do, give me a call. Okay. But uh, have a great holiday season. Thanks for your time. Dan, thank you very much.
and uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, happy holidays. See you next year.